I'm going to be talking about biological control, um, a little bit of background information on um, uh, uh, what is biological control. Uh, and during this talk, uh, especially this, the first part, I want you to think maybe about your growing situation and things you might be able to do that, will, um, that would promote biological control in your orchard or on your land. Uh, and you might uh, come up with some, some ideas for your own property. Okay, so what is biological control? Well, I think the broadest definition is the use of biological organisms to suppress pests. So um, this is one of the most commonly recognized beneficial insects that uh, almost everybody knows, the common ladybug. This, is, um, this one is Harmonia, and there's the, um, the adult. And this is the larva. It's got this racing stripe down the back on the side, which kind of identifies it. And, uh, but a lot of people don't recognize the immature form of the ladybug. And I've actually had people uh, tell me, oh, I find those on my plants and I crush them because I think they're eating my plant, you know. So that's why I, I invented that talk uh, on different beneficial insects and gave it to garden clubs and stuff so that people could get the education about recognizing the good guys from the bad guys and uh, making sure that they're doing stuff to promote the good guys. And down here at the bottom, these are the eggs of the uh, uh, ladybug usually laid near the, the um, pests that they attack, which are mostly aphids and uh, mealybugs and other insects that produce honeydew. Okay, so among the biological control organisms, probably the most commonly known are the predatory and parasitic insects. Um, and these insects make up uh, the bulk of, of um, the commercially available biocontrol measures. Um, uh, and I'm going to get into quite a bit of detail about them, and specifically the ones that we use in avocados. Okay, uh, but another biological organism is the pathogen of the pest. You know, we think of the pathogens that we have, you know, there's hepatitis, AIDS, all these different microorganisms that can attack us. Um, but all organisms pretty much have diseases as well, and insect pests and mite pests are no exception. So sometimes it's the pathogen of the pest that will uh, wipe out the pest. Um, there's a, a very common uh, uh, nuclear uh, polyhydrosis virus that affects uh, mites and will sometimes crash a brown mite population uh, and to, so that we don't need to treat it. Um, there's also uh, insects that eat weeds. And uh, uh, they're subject of biological control programs, um, typically a weed control program will take 17 year, 15 to 17 years to complete. So if you're a researcher in that field, you basically work on two projects your entire life uh, because it just takes so long to figure out that this it, the herbivore won't eat plants that we consider to be important. You know, uh, So the, uh, there's uh, basically three types of uh, biological control. And the first type I'm going to talk about is classical biological control. But there's also augmentation and conservation. And so these are the three elements that we use to try to make biological control work. Uh, so in classical biological control, you'll get a new pest come into uh, the environment. And this pest doesn't have any beneficial insects. There's you know, very few things that feed on it. And so usually that causes the pest population to increase very rapidly and it becomes a very noticeable pest, going from pretty much non-existent to just covering the plants um, because there's no control measure. And so when that happens, um, the researchers look for the country of origin of the pest. Where was this pest first reported in the literature? And then um, uh, when they narrow that down, they'll contact researchers, uh, uh, entomologists in that country, or go there themselves and they begin to search for the natural enemies of the pest. And so usually what you do when you do that is you try to find plants that are infested with the pests that you're interested in, and then you collect any other insects that are associated with them. Um, and also you can collect uh, samples of the insects themselves and cage them, and a lot of times the parasites of the pest will emerge. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. So. Once you've found some of these, these natural enemies or the beneficial insects, 
you want to bring them back to the to the country where the pest is, you know, in this case the United States. And if you want to do that, then you have to fill out this form, PPQ 526. This is the form for importing a beneficial insect into the United States. Now, uh, the the thing about these packages with the insects in them is that you can't let the insects get out of the package, right? Um, so that means that the package can only be opened in a quarantine facility, an insect quarantine facility, of which there are seven in the United States, um, by the quarantine officer or one of his designated agents. Um, so the package cannot be opened by customs or any other law enforcement agency. And so after 9-11, this became a problem. Um, they didn't want uh, these, if you put the label on this box, nobody can open that box. And uh, so basically this entire process went through review and uh, updating after 9-11 and no insects were imported for a couple of years after 9-11 until they finished this process and came up with new procedures. And now it takes about twice as long or about three years as opposed to a year and a half to get uh, this whole process going. So it's really uh, influenced the availability and um, uh, speed at which we could deploy new beneficial insects for insect pests. And in California, we get about two economically important new insect pests every year and have for the last 30 years. So biological control has been very important in keeping down uh, the, the um, uh, establishment and um, damage caused by new insect pests. Okay, so once they get them in quarantine, uh, the researchers have to figure out, are these insects really beneficial or might they have um, non-beneficial properties? So what they do is they look at the, so let's say that you had a scale insect that you were looking at a beneficial insect for. Now, will that beneficial insect eat scale insects that are native scale insects, ones that we, um, we basically want to protect, right? Because they're part of the native uh, wildlife uh, in the area. And so they have to examine them against a whole host of different insects. And they do different types of studies to see if even if they're starving or they have no other choice, will they, will they still not feed on this insect? Is it just definitely not a host? And uh, after they go through all those uh, studies in quarantine, um, then they'll apply to the USDA for permission to release the insect from quarantine. Um, and if they get the permission, then they'll um, go ahead and start mass rearing the insect in, um, in usually in insectaries run by the university. This is pretty much all takes place uh, in the university setting or one of the USDA uh, uh, stations and they'll start mass rearing this insect and releasing it in areas where the pest is known to happen to find out if it'll uh, control the insect and at that point basically one of three things is going to happen either the insect the new insect uh, new beneficial insect is going to be completely successful it's going to wipe out the pest everywhere the insect exists and drive it down to low levels so that it no longer causes damage or is considered to be a pest and it just goes off the radar screen. Um, you don't really see it anymore, or if you do, you just see a little spot of it, and then the beneficial insects uh, get in there. And uh, one of the examples of that, I don't know if any of you have uh, the hedge of Eugenia. It's an ornamental plant, and it gets a psyllid, the Eugenia psyllid. And every year in June or so, the Eugenia psyllid begins to spread, and it causes a dimple in the leaf, and um, uh, within two to three weeks of that, the beneficial insect finds the Eugenia psyllid and starts laying eggs in it. And within usually four to five weeks after the initial infestation, the Eugenia psyllid's gone and you won't see it for another year until the process repeats itself. And um, so this is considered complete control, right? The, you don't have to spray for it. Every year you see a little bit of damage, but then the damage gets cleaned up by the parasite and it's not a pest again. Um, in avocados, uh, Tom was mentioning the greenhouse thrips. Um, the greenhouse thrips uh, was, uh, as he said, one person considered it to be a key pest in avocados because it was causing widespread damage. 
Um, the university, you know, brought in the parasite, studied it, released it. Um, it didn't quite wipe out the pest. And so one of the commercial insectaries, FAR, um, began to commercially grow this parasite and sell it to the farmers. Well, after a few years, the sales just dropped off because basically it just needed a wider spread application. And, um, and then the orders stopped dropping off, so the, the insectary stopped growing it because um, there was no demand. And since then, I, I've seen several spots um, in the groves that I look at. Uh, one grove in particular, um, it has some north-facing uh, areas in, in these little small canyons where the uh, greenhouse thrifts will often show up, but it's on like three acres out of 300 acres. So it's not really a pest that we want, you know, we're really aggressive about trying to control because basically it's under complete biocontrol. And in fact, there are over 20 pests of avocados that are in that status that have the beneficial insects are completely controlling the pests and we don't ever worry about them or hardly ever see them. And so uh, like Jim McMurtry said, um, uh, you know, in avocados, it just looks like the beneficials are doing such a great job. And uh, that's really helped us reduce the number of pesticides we apply, which basically reinforces these beneficial insects and the, and the results we've had in avocados. Okay, so the next step, augmentation. So here um, is, well, I should actually back up just a little bit. I told you that when they introduce the beneficial insect, three things are going to happen. One is it can be completely successful. Well, the other thing that can happen is it's completely non-successful or unsuccessful. It can't survive in the summer. It can't survive. It's too cold in the winter. It doesn't really like the environment for some reason. Um, we haven't released enough of them. Whatever it is, the thing doesn't control the pest, and so it just fails as a candidate. And then the third thing that can happen is that it will control the pest, but dies off in the winter or it dies off in the summer and you need to re-release the insect to maintain the control. And that's when a commercial insectary gets involved. That's a candidate for them. Something that people are going to buy and keep putting out and it's cheaper than spraying, it's successful, um, but it needs to be done on a repetitive basis in order to, to keep uh, effective. So, uh, so that's when uh, we get into augmentation. Uh, so augmentation is when you mass rear an insect or some other type of uh, predator or pathogen uh, and then you, you put them out or you spray it on when the pest shows up to uh, control this uh, pest biologically. So the considerations here are what are the economics of the situation? What are the, what's the cost of the, using this control method? Uh, versus uh, chemical spray or other possible control measures. Um, what is the timing? Is the timing going to work out for you? Uh, are, there are, are there competing things that you're trying to do at that time and you can't uh, do the chemical control uh, or you can't do the biological control? So trying to figure out uh, what's the timing to make this thing effective. And then lastly, the evaluation. If you did the mass release, how effective has it been? Are you getting good establishment? Are the pest numbers going down? What's the trend line there so that you can make sure that what you're doing is, is preventing the pest uh, from causing further damage? Okay, so in conservation is the last of the three. Conservation is doing uh, things that enhance or uh, preserve the beneficial insects or other organisms in your environment. And um, as mentioned at the end of uh, Tom's talk there, there's uh, plants you can use that are um, especially uh, flowering plants that provide nectaral, nectaral uh, resources like nectar and pollen, or floral resources I mean, nectar and pollen, to um, uh, provide these beneficial insects with food in times when the pest is scarce um, so that they can survive and stay healthy and lay eggs um, when the pest shows up. So it helps keep them around. And as I mentioned, Robert Bug did a lot of work on this. And his idea was you can plant um, uh, California native plants that flower with overlapping flower periods so that there's always flowers available for these insects all year round. And um, I didn't uh, actually put it here, but there's a nursery called the Tree of Life Nursery. And they have, um, in their catalog, they have a thing called the color calendar. 
And if you look at that, they have a list of some sample um, plants and the time of year when they flower. And um, if you know that there's certain plants that you like or that you want, uh, you know, yarrow, uh, buckwheat, um, there's uh, so many different types of plants, all it's the ceanothus, the lilac plant, um, that have different flowering periods. And you can plant these plants in places where it's not particularly good to farm. You know, you have a steep slope or you have like a triangle where roads meet and you don't have any plants there or beside buildings or in places where a tree is missing and you don't want to replant. You can plant these um, native plants there and you need to water them for one year to get them established. But after that, they basically take care of themselves. They're native plants, right? So they can live on the rain and the, uh, uh, in the winter and survive all summer without irrigation. So once you establish them, they provide ongoing resources for the beneficial insects in your uh, property uh, without any input from yourself. Uh, so, um, and if you uh, want to get even more aggressive, if you have a place where a tree is missing um, that still has the irrigation water, you can plant other plants that have flowers that need irrigation, like um, uh, uh, the big showy flowers, the things that, um, uh, that uh, are more you know, accustomed in landscaping than in the native vegetation. Uh, Tree of Life Nursery. It's up in Orange County. And um, uh, there's uh, a couple nurseries here in uh, San Diego County that produce these, benefit, uh, these native plants and sell them. Uh, but they have a, this great online catalog, and that's why I'm referencing you to them, uh, because you can really get some samples of what these different plants look like. And... Um, uh, and really, as f you know, that's most of the state of the research, but I think we really need to go further and try to figure out which species um, are hosting the species of beneficials that are most important to us and really refine this uh, to, uh, uh, to our needs. So some of the other uh, factors for um, conservation are if you need to use a pesticide, use a softer pesticide, which doesn't have as much impact on beneficials. For instance, if you have persea mite, you might choose uh, oil as your pesticide, or you might choose um, Envidor, which is an insect growth regulator. Uh, and the uh, oil is a broad spectrum insecticide. It will kill just about any kind of insect it lands on. Now it does, uh, is kind of a good insecticide because it is a short residual. It doesn't last after it dries up, uh, but it kills almost anything it comes in contact with, whereas the Envidor is very selective uh, for spider mites and, and uh, mites, uh, other mites and is not as harsh on the beneficial insects. So it might be a better choice um, uh, to conserve your beneficial insects. Also, um, uh, things that you do to disrupt the grove um, might be better off if you uh, don't do the thing wholesale like stumping the trees, like maybe you don't want to stump every tree in your property in the same year. You know, you could stump uh, a block and leave some uh, smaller or a different block to continue to grow. And that allows the uh, established insects on those larger trees to migrate to the smaller trees as they're beginning to grow up. And once they have a couple years on them and they're well established and you've got a stable situation, then prune the, the, uh, the last of the trees. So there's other ways you can do it. This was very important alternate row pruning uh, for control of white flies in citrus, uh, where um, wholesale pruning would, would prune off, would prune out all the beneficial insects and the pest would reestablish and become quite a problem. But when they left the alternate rows and only pruned the row every other year, then the uh, beneficial insects could easily move between the pruned and unpruned rows and uh, keep the pest under control. And then uh, four resources, which I've already discussed. Okay, so uh, the predators. Uh, uh, what are predators? Well, predators are insects that eat multiple prey over time. So they eat um, many host insects or many host mites or whatever their host is. They eat a lot of them. And um, they're generally fast moving and they spend a lot of their time searching for the prey. So you'll often see them on the plants, running around the plants or among the uh, pest insects. Um, these are some examples of predators. You know, again, we have your common ladybug. 
Um, this is a very important predator, the lacewing, commercially available. Uh, this is a hoverfly or surfed fly. Uh, they're not commercially available, but the larvae of a lot of these flies are predaceous. Um, the praying, oops, sorry. The uh, praying mantis. Uh, this is Franklinothrips, a predatory thrips. Here it's eating a pest thrips, and it'll also eat Persea mite and brown mite. So it's one of the best predators we have in avocados, uh, but not commercially available. And then lastly over here, uh, the predatory mites. And um, you can tell the predatory mites from the pest mites because their bodies are kind of teardrop shaped instead of more diamond shape or like the pest mites. Okay, now we get to the parasitoids. Um, uh, when I was in uh, graduate school, one of my buddies told me, don't call them parasitoids. You sound like a geek when you say that. Call them parasites. But a lot of the scientists will call them parasitoids because they're not really like parasites. Like the, if you think of trichinosis in, in pork, um, that's a parasite, or um, you know, there's liver fluke, uh, it's another parasite, or tapeworm. Uh, those are parasites. Those are things that get into a host and they feed on the host, but they don't kill the host. They just make it a little less healthy, but they take in the nutrients. But the parasitoids, they kill the host. So that's how they got that designation. But if you call them parasites, everybody's going to know what you're talking about. So, uh, but I just wanted you to be aware of that different name. And in insect, the insect parasites, they only consume one host for their, uh, to reach adulthood. So basically, the, the adult female lays an egg on the host insect. The host feeds on the pest insect, eating all its internal organs. And once it's consumed the entire insect, it'll form its own cocoon and go through the pupal stage and emerge out as an adult wasp, which will then go to mate and lay eggs in other parasites. So it really only eats the one host to reach adulthood. However, these parasitoids, um, they have, uh, in, when you think of the big wasps, the one that stings, the thing that does the stinging in the parasites are the ovipositor, the thing that it uses to lay the eggs with. And um, it doesn't um, sting the hosts like we think of being stung by a wasp, um, but they use the stinger to lay the egg inside the host. But sometimes they'll use that stinger just to wound the host and they usually do it several times, and they feed on the wound exudate, or the, the, the liquid that leaks out of the wound. And that is generally fatal to the host. So in that way, they act as a predator as well. And they will often uh, do a lot of host feeding, on some species more than others, uh, over their adult life. So they, they do act as a predator later on, but still we consider them to be, the main thing is being a parasite. So this is a parasite, uh, uh, Leptomastix is a parasite of mealybugs. I'm sorry that the parasites mostly only have scientific names. So, you know, if the parasite's important, you can learn the name. Otherwise, don't worry, worry, worry about it. But she comes up to the host insect, and she uses her antenna to drum the host. So she'll tap it uh, with, her insect, with her antenna, and that can tell her if the insect is healthy, if it's already been parasitized by another parasite. Um, and then she'll walk over it in several directions and she's actually measuring the size of the host insect because um, in the, the parasites can control the sex of their offspring. And so if it's a big, plump, healthy host, then she's going to lay a female egg on it because the females produce the eggs and they need the bigger host. If it's a little scrawny one, then she'll lay a male egg on it because they just need to mate. They don't really need much food. They're okay. And... Uh, so there's basically two types, um, endoparasites, which lay their eggs on the inside of the host, and the, the, um, the young will consume from the inside, and then ectoparasites, which um, attach to the outside of the pest and feed uh, on the skin of the, of the host insect. And here are some examples of these types of parasitoids. Um, these are, this is the parasite, and it's laying an egg right now. It's brought its abdomen in, and it's going to lay an egg in this, this aphid right here. And these are what the uh, aphids look like after the parasite's um, already gone through its whole life cycle, pupated, and emerged out as an adult. It leaves behind what we call mummies. And there's, oops, sorry. And there's, these are the exit holes of the parasite as it emerged out. Here's the exit hole in a white fly, and these are exit holes in the Asian citrus psyllid 
uh, which is um, the host of tamarexia, the parasite for um, Asian citrus psyllidon citrus. Okay, so um, there are also, as I talked about, uh, diseases of these insects. Um, th this is a, a, a fungi here that's consuming this um, cicada. And uh, almost all the insects have diseases, um, but we, very few of them that we use commercially. And one of the problems in California with these products like uh, Bavaria, Bassiana, is that we don't really have high humidity. These things work great in Florida, but in California, generally, um, unless you can spray it early in the morning when there's dew and a lot of humidity, or in the winter uh, when, the, when it's really humid, uh, the, it's just not humid enough for these fungi to be really effective as a spray. There's also uh, viral uh, and bacterial diseases and uh, protozoans. Uh, which are little microorganisms. And um, uh, the one that's probably most well used is Nosema, which is um, a disease of grasshoppers that they, they go out when there's these massive grasshopper flights in the West and they spray, spread this um, uh, uh, material that's a bait with the Nosema on it and the grasshoppers eat it and it causes uh, epizootic and the whole population crashes. Uh, there's also diseases of plants. I've successfully transferred rust from nut sedge uh, to other nut sedge plants and caused the uh, nut sedge population to crash. So there's a lot of opportunities there for the use of pathogens. And in fact, one of the um, old school methods of uh, controlling pests was that you go out and you collect a bunch of the pests that you're interested in, you smash them all up, and you strain out the insect parts. And the idea is that some of those insects were infected with a disease. And then you spray the liquid that comes out, you dilute it and spray it back on the insects, and then the disease organisms get sprayed and the other insects uh, are succumb to the disease. I have to tell you that that is not a registered pesticide, so I'm not <laughs> actively recommending you do that. Okay, so um, as far as avocados, um, the, uh, the primary three uh, pests that we deal with and the beneficial insects that you can use to control them are the lace wings for avocado thrips, uh, the californicus, a predatory mite for the persea mite, and trichogramma for looper and amorbia. So uh, I'm going to talk about each of these in particular. First off, the lace wings. So generally, um, I use a release rate of 10 to 20,000 uh, lace wings per acre. Um, and uh, usually the higher figure for a one-time release, um, but I mostly encourage my clients to use multiple releases of the lower figure, about 10,000 per acre, and usually I do it every other week from the time that the, the flowers emerge until the fruit's about half an inch to three quarters of an inch long. And so usually that requires about four releases over that every other, so do it every other week. So that's usually four releases over the, uh, the period when the fruit is susceptible. And, um, and that has largely been successful. And I have to tell you that when a grower first approached me about this back in the 90s, late 90s, when the avocado thrips came in, I was very skeptical. And I told him, I don't think this is going to work. And I don't think you should rely on it. You know, we have Veritran, let's, let's do it. And he goes, no, I want to use these predators. I've used them in my citrus, and they've really worked great. So. We used them and we were successful and I was still dubious, you know. Maybe they're not really going to be that effective. Maybe it's just a fluke, you know, because at that time it was quite variable where your growth was, how much damage you got. So we did it the next year and we were successful in the next year and the next year. And by the fourth year, finally I said, okay, I guess this does work. And so I started recommending it for other growers. But I have to say that overall, I still mostly use an insecticide instead of lace wings for the groves mostly because of risk factors um, uh, and the grower preference. But I always try to bring it up in the conversation that this is an option uh, for uh, thrips control. And here's, of course, what the fruit looks like when they get thrips scarring. So um, this is a card of lacewing eggs. So what they do is they, they have this card that has little perforated squares. So each one of these is, was attached to this card. It's got a perforation up the middle and then a bunch of them down the sides so that each one of them has one of these holes in it. And the, the square, we call them squares, even though they're rectangles, are about that big. 
and they uh, take the card, it's a heavy card stock, and they make a swipe of glue on it, and then they pour on the number of uh, lacewing eggs they're going to put on it, and then they put on dead moth eggs onto the rest of the card. So that absorbs the rest of the glue, and that's mostly the, what you see on there, that kind of beige color. And uh, that way, when the lacewing hatches, it can eat these moth eggs to get its first meal. Um, because the lacewing are cannibalistic, and if there are only eggs on there, they would just go eat their brothers and sisters before they even hatched. So they are vicious. Those things are unbelievable predators. They'll eat anything that moves. Um, so, oops, let's see. So the release methods, um, so what I uh, have the grower do is to uh, take these squares, they divide up the card, and then you walk through and you put one square on every tree. So that way, the, the lacewings don't really like thrips. They're not really a thrips predator. They like aphids and mealybugs and stuff like that that produce honeydew. And it's the taste of the honeydew that makes the lacewing lay its eggs. And there's no, lace, there's no honeydew on avocados. We don't have hardly any homopteran insect pests. Uh, so, um, uh, so what we do is we act as the egg layer. And we lay the eggs every other week, so there's wave after wave of predators searching the trees for these pockets of the, of the pest. And another method that uh, one of the other entomologists uh, uses is he's got, um, it's kind of like a leaf blower, but it has a, a little water tank, and it sprays water into this air stream. And so it blows the water up into the tree like a, like a low volume uh, uh, sprayer. And um, so he mixes the eggs in the water, and, it, and the water feeds into the stream, and it blows the eggs up into the tree. And he thinks he gets much better dispersal into the tree with this method as opposed to my method, which you only get, it's only on one branch of the whole tree, right? But he's getting it all over the tree. So that's the other method that people have used. And we've we experimented with dropping them out of helicopters and doing all kinds of different ways. But these are basically the methods that have been settled on. Um, and the next one is the uh, predatory mite, Californicus, for uh, Persea mite. And uh, when this pest first came out and we started releasing the predatory mites for it, um, we didn't really have very good success with it. And I think it's because we, our timing was not good and our methods for release were not that good. Um, but over time, we've gotten better, although still it's not the most dependable system that I've worked with. You know, usually you'll get control, but sometimes um, if, the, if you didn't start early enough, the mite can still outstrip the predator and you need to spray. Um, but uh, seven to 10,000 per acre. Uh, and uh, you want to start when the pest is just in the early stages. And generally, uh, what I recommend that you do if you want to use this method is that in the spring, when the new leaves are starting to emerge, you take some type of material like colored yarn or flagging tape and you wrap it around the branch in a place you frequently go, like near an irrigation valve or something. In, you put it on the branch in between the old growth and the new growth, so that you know that every leaf outward from that mark is a new leaf this year. And when you start seeing the damage on those new leaves, that's the time to put the predator out. And uh, application method, uh, basically you can um, you can just sprinkle them around the tree that's infested. You can, I've taken uh, French fry bags and stuck the leaves down in the bag and then put the predatory mites in there so they can climb from the bag up on the leaf. I've used a, a little hand sprayer, like a little mister, and mist the leaf and then you pour the eggs, on, the mites on it and they stick to the water. And as the water dries out, the mites crawl out and up into the tree from there. So there's quite a number of methods to apply them. Uh, trichogramma for amorbia, um, uh, generally 100,000 plus. Tom said 100 to 200,000. Um, and these, uh, these little parasites are egg parasites, so they're attacking the eggs of the amorbia. So basically, you want to track the, um, uh, the, uh, the adults using a pheromone trap. And um, you know, Tom said, as Tom said, there's no the, you know, the university's never come up with a recommendation on when to treat. My personal observation, I treat about, when I get about 250 moths in a trap over a week period. And uh, when you get the peak flight of the, 
of the moths, the male moths, that is shortly before the peak flight of the female moths, and that is right before the egg laying. And so by the time you catch the males and you put in the order for the trichogramma and you receive them and put them out, you're about the time when the eggs are being laid and the pest is susceptible to the, the parasite. And again, you hang the squares. They look very similar to what you saw for the lacewing, uh, but you, can, you don't have to put them on every tree because these things can fly. Um, so you can only put them on, well, generally, the pattern is every sixth tree on every sixth row. So if you ever you know, need that, you can call me and I'll go through that more with you. Um, and for me personally, um, I go back and evaluate and look for hatches of the loopers because sometimes the timing isn't right and you get hatch of the looper. And if that's the case, then I usually come back in with the BT, the Bacillus syringiensis, of which there are quite a number of products registered in avocados. And then that picks up the last of the, the worms so that you don't get damage. Um, but I've only had to spray probably less than 10% of the time when I made the release, maybe even less than 5%. It's just been a few times uh, when I've actually had to spray in addition to the release. Usually the release will do the trick. Okay, now uh, how do you bring this all information all into a plan for your own orchard? So uh, I think the first thing you need to think about is have you applied pesticides recently? Is there a residue of the pesticide that could harm the beneficiary you're releasing? Because if you release them, they land on the leaves, they get poisoned and they die, you're not going to get a good effect. So you want to think about the history, what's been happening with your grove up to this point. Are you really in a position where you could release the insect and be confident that they're going to survive? And luckily in avocados, we don't use a lot of pesticides, so generally that's not an issue, but it's the first thing to keep in mind because you it's the most likely thing to kill the effort you're trying to make with the beneficials. And what about future pesticide use? Uh, are you uh, planning to use a pesticide for some other problem in the near future that could knock out the beneficial that you just released? So really, the pesticides are the big bugaboo here. Did you, have you used them in the past, or are you going to use them in the future? And then uh, efficacy. How effective do you think these beneficials are going to be? And what are your alternatives if they're not effective? Uh, could you release some more to tip the balance? Or are you going to need to come in with a pesticide spray? So what is the e efficacy you're expecting? And how are you going to measure that efficacy to be sure that what you're um, doing is effective in controlling the pest? And then there's the risk. And pest management is all about risk management, um, trying to figure out what's my real risk of loss and what are my alternatives, and how risky are those alternatives? And you know, the, uh, the pesticide is a pretty much a known quantity. If um, uh, you know, they develop resistance over time, so you might see slightly less effect year to year. But by the time you're getting into real resistance, you've already seen that coming. So you're going to know that uh, the pesticide is not going to be as effective. Um, but otherwise, you know that the pesticide is going to give you the bang for the buck. You know what the cost is going to be. And you, um, you know, really the, the factors more for it are, can you get the helicopter when you need it? Um, and is your grove big enough to, that the guy's going to come you know, within a couple of weeks of the time you call him? Or is he going to really string you out because he's got bigger growers that are you know, uh, easier to do and making him more money? So there's a, all the risks that you're juggling um, need to be taken into account to see if these beneficials are really a way to go for you. And then the timing. What is the proper timing to make the beneficials really effective and get the most out of them? And then the logistics. How long does it take to get the insects? Are the insects available at that time? Or is the demand so great at that time that they're going to sell out? Do you need to get your order in early so that uh, you're sure to get them when you, when you need them? And this has been a real on and off problem with the trichogramma for Amoria because um, the, it's such a, a, a problem that it doesn't happen every year. Um, certainly loopers and Amoria are out there every year, but they don't cause damage every year. And so people don't release the trichogramma every year. But the insectaries still have to produce it. So if they're producing it and not selling it, you know, where's the incentive for them? So a lot of them are asking for uh, larger growers to um, 
to contract for at least some small number of them to disperse in their grove, they're going to find the amorbi and the loopers that are there and attack them and keep that population rolling. But mostly it's going to keep the insectary in business and the availability of, of trichogramma in existence. Because if we lose it, then we're back to BT and lanate uh, alone, and we won't have the, the good beneficials. So uh, I guess in summary, biolog biological control agents can be effective against your important pests, but plan ahead and work with experienced uh, professionals if you want to get the best results. Thank you very much. Well, the, the lacewings and avocados, um, generally you'll see, uh, or I see anyway, uh, large increases in the number of lacewings on the avocados when the first flush comes out in response to the presence of white flies on the leaves. So I told you earlier that the, green, the lacewings lay their eggs in response to the honeydew, which is the excrement of homoptrous insects, the insects that suck the sap, like aphids, white flies, mealybugs, and scale insects. And so the white flies get on these leaves, they lay their eggs, they're feeding, they're, they're uh, depositing the honeydew, and when the lacewings come along, they find these leaves with the, lay, with the white flies on them, and they'll lay their eggs. And so you can find the eggs, and sometimes, you know, there's uh, scale insects and other insects that are just occasional on, on uh, avocados that'll cause the lacewings to lay their eggs on them. Um, but lacewings don't lay their eggs for thrips. And as I said earlier, we have to be the ones who do the egg laying. So um, even in these situations where you've had a fair number of lacewing uh, lay their eggs from the white flies, basically the white fly are not a pest on avocados because once the larvae um, uh, uh, um, uh, come out of the eggs and start feeding on the avocado leaf, there's a really excellent parasite that comes along and wipes out all the white fly. And so the white fly just don't survive, and they don't keep laying or keep making honeydew, and so the lacewing will stop laying their eggs. And so by the time the avocado thrips become important, the lacewings are mostly out of the picture unless you're supplementing them. So even though they are part of the natural world and they are part of the natural cycle on avocados, I haven't found enough of them there to control the white, the, the lacewing or the uh, avocado thrips without.